Okay, so I think we're going to start. It seems that everybody is pretty much logged in. So welcome everybody, I think, to a very uh, important and timely conversation. The title, the title of today's uh, meeting discussion is called The Festering Wound, Racism in the United States. Where do we go from here? And I remember a few weeks ago, two weeks ago or so, we had a conversation on issues of anti-Semitism and racism. And Kevin Rome, the president of Fisk, who should be joining us, but he hasn't signed in yet, he kind of went through a list of uh, African-American men that were killed, killed by the police. And two weeks ago, there was something slightly perhaps abstract about it, but two weeks later, we're in this uh, historic moment, this crisis that was um, brought out by the murder, the ghastly murder of George Floyd. And I would like, so we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to introduce everybody briefly. But I would like to say that the purpose of this conversation is which way forward. And I think unlike the media, the discourse in the media, I would just like to sort of set some ground rules, if I may, I'm, even though I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues. These are the, the ground rules. Systemic racism is just a fact. From, from slavery to Jim Crow to socioeconomic, political, cultural segregation, which is backed up by an ideology, for a theology, science, the social sciences, which all have over the years, over the decades, even to this day, justifies, excuses, or pays lip service to a reality, a, a reality born in violence. It's a civilizational fact which affects the United States of America and other colonial or post-colonial societies, as certainly these ideas are alive and well in the motherland of racism, Europe. So these are just facts. The conversation, I, don't, I would prefer not to go and explore or justify the fact that systemic racism exists but to have a conversation on how to address it and how to move forward. Um, we have an amazing group of speakers that have taken their time to be with us. And I would just like to say uh, one, one issue in terms of the work of ISGAP. Um, many of the people who are with us have passed through our summer program who are friends and colleagues of ISGAP and of the work of ISGAP. Elie Wiesel was our first honorary president, and he always taught us that anti-Semitism begins with Jews, but it never ends with Jews, and that we have a, a moral commitment to fight for justice everywhere and to fight for human rights, and certainly within our society connected to the United States and other Western societies, that we have an obligation to fight for social justice and to stand with the victims of oppression. And this is the key lesson that he taught us. And racism is a part of the fighting racism, understanding racism is a core element of the mission of ISGAP. ISGAP is certainly focusing on anti-Semitism, but the relation to other forms of discrimination and particularly racism and the plight of people of African descent and of, of Jewish origin. And sometimes I know Katja will say they're interrelated. There is an African, a Jewish presence in Africa and they're African-American Jews, et cetera. But there is a, a strong historical connection of a shared tragic history of oppression and of abuse. And in, as racism changes and as anti-Semitism changes or anti-Semitisms with an S changes, at the end of the day, the experiences are not dissimilar. There are commonalities and there are, um, I'd say, factors that try to separate the experiences of the two communities and the two communities struggling against a resurgence of racism and a resurgence of anti-Semitism. And I think, I hope that these conversations will not only bridge gaps between the African-American and Jewish communities, but also forge a deeper understanding of ways to move forward and tackle these issues in a systemic way and to create an agenda that is progressive and that could change, change the, the reality. So I'm really honored to introduce the panel today. 
the first speaker will be Harold Bennett. Harold is a uh, professor, the chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religion at Morehouse College. It's, it's the preeminent historically black college. That's where Martin Luther King was affiliated and associated with. It's a very prestigious university. We have Dr. Suni Ali from Northeastern University. Also, Harold and Suni passed through our summer program at Oxford, the ISGAP summer program. We also have uh, Professor Katya Gibil Mirovich. Uh, she's a professor of anthropology and American studies at Grinnell College. And she took the program and has been a teacher on our summer institute for the past several years. We have an old friend and colleague of mine, Abebe Zagaya. Abebe is at Bahir Dar University in Ethiopia. He's also, he was a professor in Oxford and in South Africa. And um, the Summer Institute, I don't know, I don't think anybody on this panel knows, but the Summer Institute, the idea of the Summer Institute that we hold at Oxford every year was actually Abebe's idea. In the summer of 1989, Abebe Zagaya organized the Summer Institute on Racism and Colonialism. And in exchange for helping him, I was a student, in exchange for helping him, he allowed me to enter the program without paying tuition, which was a great thing as a, a student. And the, it was, a, I think, a, a, a mind-changing experience to spend a month in Oxford learning with some of the greatest uh, scholars of issue, dealing with issues of colonialism and racism. And it, um, it really it planted the seed for what we're doing now with ISGAP. And I'm happy that uh, we re a baby and I reconnected and we're going to be doing some work together. Um, I hope uh, Kevin Rome will rejoin us again. He's the president of Fisk University and also lectured on our summer institute. And we also have uh, Victoria uh, Kamsler who will be speaking. She is a scholar formerly at Princeton University and Wesleyan College and also an Oxford graduate. And she spoke at the last session two weeks ago and she is joining us. And we have Professor Ansel Brown. Ansel Brown is a visiting assistant professor at North Carolina Central University in their law school. And he's also a colleague from our Summer Institute, took the Summer Institute. And we're developing, if you go to our website, a program on issues of African and Jewish homeland and diaspora studies. So he is the co-director of that. And the final speaker, or I'll be the final speaker, but uh, Carlton, Carlton Long is with us. I don't see him on the screen, on my screen. I have to reconfigure the screen. There we go, now I can see him. Uh, Carlton Long is a scholar. He's the head of the CEO of Lawrence and Long uh, Educational Consulting. And he's also the director of pedagogy with ISGAP and started the ISGAP uh, Oxford Summer Institute with me uh, more than well, almost six years ago. And is an old friend and colleague from our student days in Oxford. Um, so I will hand over the uh, the, plot, the, 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 the speaker to, um, to Harold Bennett from Morehouse College and he'll start off the, the conversation. And I'm asking the speakers to please speak briefly for like two or three minutes because we're so many speakers and then we'll have a conversation. So Professor Bennett, the floor is yours and thank you for being here. Well, well good morning from Atlanta and I thank uh, the community for uh, this, this conversation. Um, I only have two minutes, so let me get right to what I want, want to say. This issue of racism in America and even in the world is, is, is sad. But the thing though that I'd like for us to really, what I think about is when you start looking at the issue of racism, I'm very much concerned with this ideological moorings. And I think the way forward, the way forward is for us to, to find ways to, to address the ideological foundations of this, 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 this tragedy, this stain on humankind. That would mean our institutions that are responsible with shaping values, shaping beliefs, shaping ideas about how we perceive the other. We've got to take more of a proactive approach to, to looking at the way the images, the stereotypes that we put out there so that we can put something in the field, ideas in the field. Hopefully we can inculcate values in people um, that will see human beings and recognize the full humanity of everyone else. But I think the way forward then has to, it rests solely with our education entities, our religious institutions, uh, those entities that are controlling the media, whether it's print or social, music. We've got to find a way to use these mechanisms to dismantle these problematic beliefs about how we perceive 
the others, and in our case, blacks and, and Jews. In this case, blacks, it's, 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 it's an issue of, I think, of how we're perceiving others. And we, the way forward then is to sit down and to be very strategic with our, those entities that are responsible for shaping beliefs, ideas, you know, principles. We, 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 we've got to utilize the power and the platforms that they possess to do something about this problem I call, that, that we're talking about right now. Thank you very much, Harold. I appreciate your comments, and we'll we'll get back to these the important issue that you raised in the conversation. Uh, so next, Dr. Suni Ali. Sorry, Suni, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me on the panel. I'm very excited. I want to just start off by saying my my skin is my sin, and you know about thirty years ago I was put in a chokehold and would have died had it not been for a few of my friends who knocked the police police officer off of me, and I really rarely share that story. I don't want to go into too much detail, but I'm fortunate to be here, and I think part of this whole conversation we're having. Uh, to get to some solutions, I wanted to start off by talking about what Tupac once declared in the song called Trapped. He said, you know, they got me trapped in this prison of seclusion. Happiness living on the streets is a delusion. Tired of being trapped in this vicious cycle. If one more cop harassed me, I just might go psycho. So when you look at racism, xenophobia, xenophobia anti-Semitism, we have to look at how it places blacks and Jews living in this world community uh, into a vicious cycle of, of, a, of a prison sentence. And it, it really challenges and speaks to the inhumanity toward uh, people of color, primarily blacks and Jews. And, you know, despite however successful African Americans are economically, still in America, we're three times higher to exist in poverty right, uh, than a white person. A college-educated Black, on average, earns less or about the same as a white person with a high school diploma. So even when Blacks, when we succeed in education, we still are denied certain opportunities. And then when we look at our Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, there was an award that was provided in the summer of 2018 from a rap duo. Uh, they won a Germany Echo Music Award for having lyrics that said more defined than altruist prisoners. And then the artist even further said in the lyrics, make another Holocaust show up with the Maltov. And they got an award for this. And even now the environment in Europe blames Jewish people for starting COVID-19 in a bio lab. So these, these tropes, this xenophobia, this racism, this constant um, anti-Semitism is, 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 is always in our face. And, you know, recently we had in, in America um, where President Donald Trump spoke about applying the Second Amendment to put down the, the, uh, the, the uh, protests in Washington, D.C. And as he stood in front of St. John Episcopal Church, he held the Bible upside down and he, he pretty much said, I will mobilize civilian military resources to stop the rioting and looting, protect the rights of law-abiding Americans, including your Second Amendment rights. To me, this was clearly a call for white supremacists, militias, and anarchists soliciting gun use to put down a rebellion. And we already know about how the Second Amendment, unfor the Second Amendment, unfortunately, is oftentimes it was framed to keep slaves on the plantation and to and to form militias. To, to contain them. Uh, Huey P. Newton once said that the black community is seen as a colony and the police serve as an occupying ar army. So I think through this, it's important for us to continue to work together, fighting for what's right while we push, while we push for change agency to stop racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism. And to me, the legacy of unity from the 60s that teaches us the compelling history lesson of Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, who were murdered in Mississippi for attempting to register people to vote. The violent police actions that remain strong against Black folks must be replaced by direct action campaigns to enforce passage of federal laws for murdering 
an unarmed black person in America. And if we don't do that, then we're gonna continue to see what Tupac mentioned in the song when he says, one day I'm gonna bust, blow up the society. Why did you lie to me? I couldn't find a trace of equality. And so you can only push people on the corner so long. So we can no longer allow racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism to imprison Blacks and Jews in a perpetual prison. History can be wiped away or dismissed as though it never happened. And it's up to us to release Blacks and Jews from this awful prison sentence. And I hope we talk about how we build community organizations, how we have community police boards, how we have um, education that actually have classes that are man mandatory in terms of general course requirements on racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism. So on that note, I appreciate again you uh, for listening to me. Lenny, thank you. Thank you for your insights and it was a very po powerful presentation. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I to, horrible to hear your experience. Um, terrible crazy. So th thank you for your contribution, sharing your personal experience, not just your intellectual insights. Thank you. Um, so the next person is uh, Katya. So the floor is yours. Th thank you. Thank you, Suni. Well, okay, so I think I unmuted myself and I'm um, following up with Tupac. I'm a different generation. So my go-to was a suppose the compliment would be Langston Hughes. I wanted to share my screen. If you don't mind, I am going to try to do that. Um, so, but I can't see anybody. So can you all see Harlem 1951? No. What happens in deferred? No. It's, it's not there? No, only your name is there. Ira, no, Ira can help. Um, so then I'll, I'll, come, I'll, I'll come back out quickly. I don't want to waste anybody's time. Um, here I go. Okay. Gotcha. Are you, okay. Are you able to forward it to Ira or? Yes, I'll forward it to Ira and others can Google while I'm speaking. Um, but it's the Langton Hughes, what happens to a dream deferred. And of course that was uh, Raisin in the Sun was the title of Lorraine Hansberry's play that was very famous. And um, we've forgotten some things, I think. And I've been giving a lot of thought to that. I react on two different levels. One is the uh, one is being an academic and what we do in the classroom. And I recognize, particularly now speaking to some of my students um, who were not in the classes anymore, there is a generation gap. But I do remember being 18 and protesting at Columbia University and being 12 at the March on Washington and being in the Poor People's Campaign March. There have been so many marches and so many protests. So I want to just focus on two things. One is I am pleased, unfortunately pleased, to see that more and more people are speaking about racism and not about race, because the issue of race as a category, as some kind of human biological distinction, is just bogus. But speaking about racism speaks about actions. And the other thing that I think is going to be very important moving forward after the protest, when we're back in the classroom, when people are doing whatever uh, inter-dialogues they're doing with other people, is putting an emphasis specifically on racism, specifically on racism and black skin and brown skin. What you look like, what you look like, impacts how you are treated in anonymous environments. So I can speak a lot about the color hierarchy within the black community, the color hierarchy within American history, how white passing does not mean white, it's distinct from white, but what we can't forget is that if you are brown, if you are black, if you are young, if you are brown or black and young and male, and you are walking in the street today, you are a target. However, the emphasis in the way that we speak has got to be on the racism and the agency of the person who acts against that black person. So George Floyd and the long list of people they were not killed because they were black. That puts the responsibility on them. They were killed by racists. Racists committed an act. I think how we speak and how we learn to speak is going to help shape how we insist on accountability. The other is that we've got to now move away from this million dollar industry that's called diversity. 
we don't need diversity in that sense. I don't need people to like me. I need people to behave and not to discriminate. And then where there's discrimination, both overt and discreet, there has to be some accountability They have to be taken, they have to be responsible for their actions. And the last thing that I wanna point out is this question of, there was a question in the chat about action and the fact that we have not heard as much from the Orthodox Jewish community as we should. We actually haven't heard anything from the evangelical community either. I think that actions are the way that we judge what people do. James Baldwin, there's a t-shirt that, you know, I see, I judge you by what, not what I see, but how you act. I think that action speaks louder than words. And so we've got to begin to see some kind of accountability for what we actually do. It may be very big. It may be people who speak out in public, but speaking out in public is visceral. It's ephemeral. It feels good. Question is what happens after the tedious work of the Saul Alinsky type, the grassroots kind of work, the way we open up our doors to other people. Um, so actions, I think, are just much more important than words. And finally, my last comment, you know, is Malcolm X's ballot and the bullet. It would be really important for a lot of people who are listening today, including us on the panel, to reread and listen, because now there's the transcript, so we can read and we can listen to Malcolm X. Oratory skills is, is, is an understatement, but his discussion in the ballot or the bullet, we are exactly in that moment. And so for me, right now, the protests are really important. The trial is going to be really important. But the most important thing, we do live in a democracy, supposedly. This is not Israel with coalition governments. We need to get people out to vote. So we need to start mobilizing all the young people as was done in 1963. People have got to get registered. Whatever the gerrymandering is taking place, nevertheless, a lot of people need help in getting their documents together, in getting registered to vote. And most important, on election day, there's got to be a network that makes sure that people can actually get to wherever they have to get to, to vote. So I think that voting has to be number one. Accountability and holding people accountability for their actions has to be number two, but they go together. And so I would say that as somebody who is black and somebody who is Jewish, lots of analogies can be made. They're very important, but there are also limits to analogies. And so I think I will rest there. That's my two minutes. Okay. Thank you very much, Katya. Thanks for your wisdom and insights. Professor Dr. Bebe Zagaya, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here and to, to be part of this, this, this panel and meeting old friends and hopefully new friends as well. Kind of my life history is interesting in the sense is I lived in the West most of my adult life. I went to school and I also taught in those institutions, both in Europe and in North America. And later on, I taught in South Africa. What occurs, I mean, I, I taught Black Studies and I was privileged to be teaching with Cedric Robinson, who passed away not long ago. And we used to talk about this issue all the time, uh, being a Pan-Africanist. And also I spent time teaching uh, and researching in, 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 in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, in Israel. What occurs throughout this, what I see now, is in times of crisis, minorities are attacked. I mean, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, we have the genocide of the Armenians. The depression, we have the, the rise of Hitler and what happened in the Holocaust. We also tend to forget and not to understand that we, we get caught up about international politics. It's very interesting to see what the Chinese are saying about what's happening in the US now and what the US is saying about Chinese. In the sense, the Chinese are basically trying to use what happened in, in, in and, and it's this is done by Soviet Union one time, now it's being done by China. But we tend to forget not only what happened in Tiananmen Square, but also what the Chinese are doing to the Muslim community. We tend to also forget 
the kind of dynamic there is in quote unquote developing countries, whether it's the Arab countries or African countries or Asian countries. We tend to forget what Arab enslavement, enslavement have done to Africans. We, you know, yes, there is always a mention of European slavery and the colonialism. One of the most horrible places to be now, for me, as an African, is South Africa. It's just bizarre to say, because me and Charles, you know, and most of you were most likely were part of the anti-apartheid movement. Now, you cannot walk as a Congolese or a Zimbabwean or as an Ethiopian on the street of Johannesburg safely. So how do we account for these things? How do we begin? I think there was a two, two things. I mean, first, uh, Harold from, I think Zahra who talks about values. What are the values we are, we are uh, 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 enshrining? And Katia, behavior, she talks about behavior. For, I think we need to move whereby, you know, for me, for instance, I cannot go now. At the present, it used to be easy for me to go to Soviet Union, but I cannot go now to, to Soviet Union. I cannot work on the street of, of St. Petersburg. I rather call it Leningrad, but St. Petersburg. I cannot walk in the street of Johannesburg, not only because of my skin, but also because of where I come from. As an Ethiopian, as an African, I'm not tolerating that. Therefore, I think we need to begin to think, to globalize this issue. It doesn't only happen in the US, but it happened almost in the society. And we tend to be caught up in slogans so that we link one movement with the other without, without really trying to push some kind of a global agenda. Therefore, I think, I think what I see what's happening now, last night I was, I was watching the, 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 the TV program about one of the famous uh, British poet who lives, I think, in Lincolnshire, which is one of the most white, white uh, counties. Thing. He said, you know, he said he's tired. He's done this so many times. I mean, he's, uh, he's my age in the 60s. And he's done this so many times. Therefore, I think what I learned from what's going on and, I, uh, and what we can do now is to begin to, you know, to move with a global dialogue. And I think that's one of the things we learned from what Jewish group have done with the Soviet Union, what anti-apartheid has done about apartheid, but we haven't far, gone far enough because it becomes a you know, kind of sectional, balkanized debate. I think we need to move away from that. And the African-American experience might help us to push forward for universal values, for universal behavior, where I don't have to fear. I, as a person of, uh, of, of an African origin, uh, that I cannot work on the street of Johannesburg or uh, thing. And for Ethiopians, I always say it, you know, the, and when I arrived in the in, in, in the 70s to, 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 to the US, there were two Ethiopians who were killed on, um, I think somewhere in Oklahoma because they were sent to send Bible. They saw them as black and they shot them dead. For, for I think what I'm trying to say is there is this universal issues of, let's not talk about race, let's not talk about diversity, but let's talk about behavior, let's talk about racism, and how can we stop that? I think that's the lesson I think we can draw from this discussion. I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abebe. Thanks for your insights and wisdom and experience. And the next speaker will be Victoria Kampsler. Victoria, the floor is yours. Welcome. And thank you for the, um, all the panel's contributions. Well, we all know that uh, in a couple of weeks, Juneteenth approaches. It's the 155th anniversary of when, of when emancipated Black people celebrated the end of slavery. And they thought that their rights and dignity would be recognized and that they would be treated as full citizens of the United States. But we know that's not what happened. 155 years ago, they were denied the right to vote, they were denied the right to hold property, and they were targeted viciously. And how much of that has really changed? Um, now, South Africa had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but where is Truth and Reconciliation in the United States? Instead, we have, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. 
Instead, we have let's dominate the battle space. Instead, we have the violation of every First Amendment right in the unconstitutional clown show at Lafayette Park. So it's been really hard for me to come up with something to say about this. Um, and I kind of I kind of have some feeling for Justin Trudeau, who was asked a couple days ago what he thought about President Trump and the way he boasts about using military force to put down peaceful protesters. And Tr Trudeau took 21 seconds and three tries to, to respond. He was completely lost for words. And it is hard to put into words what to think and feel about Amy Cooper and the cold-blooded murder of George Floyd. And some part of me really just wants to shut up and listen to the outcry of the people who have been so wronged and targeted and hunted because of the color of their skin. And especially after Amy Cooper, the, the unwritten rules of white privilege were revealed in such a dramatic and self-traumatizing way that it's really hard for me to have the nerve to speak about these things. But I keep coming back to the idea that this is a change that we are all seeking and it's something that we must all contribute to in our own ways. I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Bennett for talking about the important of, importance of our cultural images and perceptions. And I had two images in mind that I was juxtaposing for myself. And one was the image of the mounted police who were assailing protesters at Lafayette Square. And the second one is a local one, a local girl in the Oakland protests named Brianna Noble. And I don't know if you saw that picture, it went around the world, but it's just a very simple image of Brianna Noble is an equestrian. She is a strong black woman. She took her horse, Dapper Dan, and rode at the front of the protests in Oakland. And she said, um, she said, I was just pissed sitting at home and seeing the video of George Floyd. I felt helpless and I thought to myself, I'm just another protester if I go down there alone, but no one can ignore a black woman sitting on top of a horse. And this, you know, after all the shock and stun and horror, that's the thing that finally broke me and moved me to tears because that powerful image, that courage and the juxtaposition with the, with the memories of people being hunted down on horseback was so powerful for me. Um, so I, I came back to, you know, what do I have to, contribute to all of this mess. And um, I'll just briefly say that as a former professor of political philosophy and ethics, I spent a lot of time teaching social contract theory. And the fundamental social contract of society is supposed to show that members of a society have reason to endorse and comply with the fundamental rules, laws, institutions, and principles of that society. It's supposed to show that those that that political system is legitimate and worthy of loyalty. Um, it's to show that moral and political and legal rules can be rationally justified to each member of society. And, and, and an outcropping of that theory is that if a social contract is fair, then it can give us an answer to the question, why should I obey the law? This, this answer is not then going to be reduced to the fact that some police or some judicial power can, can force it on us. We can assent to obey the law if we live under a true social contract and we should obey the, the law because it is at least typically, at least an intent, at least most of the time, at least for all of us equally, its administration is fair, it is just, and we as rational citizens can agree to be governed by it. On June 1st, the New York Times showed a pod, it's in the podcast, The Daily. And I was going to play a quick, sum yeah. up, please. Okay, sorry. So yeah, yeah um, I'll just skip ahead. So um, I just want to say, you know, it, it, Barack Obama spoke about, um, from our Brothers Keepers Initiative, he said that, you know, the answers are to these things are local and based in communities. And I was happy to see him, but I was also depressed because Attorney General Keith Ellison in Minnesota, we know he's handling that case against the four police officers very carefully, because if there is a change of venue because of uh, the, the uh, uh, violation of, of jury impartiality, he knows darn well that if it goes to another community, impartial justice cannot be assured. 
Um, and I just, maybe I'll save for the comments, but what really helped me uh, to go on from President Obama's remarks was some remarks made by Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative. And I just, I'll end by saying that five years ago, just like the coronavirus task force, the White House had a task force to attempt to create solutions to policing injustices. And that task force had 40 pages of recommendations and the Trump administration completely abandoned those recommendations. They didn't create the financial incentives and they, and they, they made the Justice Department infrastructure around, this, around that initiative disintegrate. So I, um, I have learned from Brian Stevenson what the substance of those recommendations were and I'll save that for our discussion, but I found it was, it was really insightful and helpful. And I, I, if I could, I would give him the last word. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you for your insights and wisdom as well. Um, Ansel Brown, Professor Ansel Brown, the floor is yours. And Ansel, I'd just like to say, has done amazing work on issues of Pan-Africanism and Zionism, which I found really inspiring. So Ansel, I'm happy you're here and, and the floor is yours. All right, well, good day and thank you, Charles and ISGAP for engaging this critical discussion. I sincerely appreciate many, many of the already prudent thoughts of my colleagues. I think those with their eyes open, even at a squint, can see that there's a real and festering wound of racism in America where I think we need to focus and how is how pervasive is that wound. And while exposing the root source, we need to pursue a remedy of practical, systemic, and sustainable policy that will deter, neutralize, and counter the deathly persistence of racism in our society. Now, the, the truth is that we've witnessed a disturbing spike in white nationalism and extremism over the past four years unleashed against Blacks, Jews, and many others. And while I believe we must tackle this bigotry head on through a multi-pronged strategy, we must do so with the sobriety that racism in America is not a four-year-old problem, but a 400-year-old problem that, that does not only manifest as police brutality, but also as implicit bias in employer hiring and promotion decisions. Yes, it does manifest in white nationalism, but also in systemic, institutionally fostered, uh, institutionally fostered economic, educational, and health inequities. It manifests as mass incarceration and hate crimes, but it also manifests as a privileged white woman breaking the law in a park who feels entitled to summon the cops on a law-abiding black man who would dare challenge her sense of privilege. It manifests as incitement in the White House to deploy the military and vicious dogs on sincere and disheartened Americans, ironically protesting the um, abuse of power, but it also manifests as the National Football League blackballing and making a public example of a black athlete who dare use his platform to peacefully protest police brutality. It manifests through those who um, slander American citizens and leaders of color by telling them to return to their countries, but it also manifests as those feel deeply entitled to define our blackness as our loyalty to their agenda. The blight of racism in America is not merely institutional, but it's social. And its seeds are personal. Even when we huddle in our own comfortable cultural circles and secretly in our hearts, stereotype the other as unworthy of equal embrace. This sickness is not truly a sickness of superiority, but I believe it's a sickness of hidden and irrational fears of inferiority, masking as superiority to stabilize what is frail within. And while a deeper psychoanalysis of how to uproot the deepest recesses of the sweat festering wound is perhaps another discussion for another time, and while we do need peaceful protests to shine light on the issue, I want to channel our immediate focus on the need for a federal policy response that will compel states to prosecute hate crimes and excessive use of deadly force by authorities, and frankly, so many other issues. Just as leaders of the civil rights movement recognized that states would not police themselves in curbing violent violations of the 14th and 15th Amendments without federal compulsion, we need a, fed, a focused, legislative agenda crafted by leaders within the community, supported by politicians and lobbyists, but not fashioned by them, lest the community's agenda be diluted by other interests and ulterior agendas. 
we cannot change hearts through policy alone, but shifts in so, um, social norms that defy the status quo are almost always resisted until they become embedded in the social fabric through the law and other effective means. And then hearts and normative social consciousness comes into compliance. The law is powerful, and I believe we need to use it to effectuate real change in our society. Thank you very much, Ansel. Thank you for your uh, clear message and uh, an important message. Um, the final speaker will be Carlton Long. Carlton is the director of pedagogy with ISGAP and is responsible for much of our work. So Carlton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charles. And I, it's an honor to be on this panel with these colleagues, um, all of whom I know. And I'm, I'm terribly proud uh, to be uh, in their company, uh, especially academically, intellectually, and um, socially, sociopolitically today. Um, I'm going to start this conversation, I think, I think I'd like to start this conversation with my father and end it with my mother and talk about everybody in the world in between. Um, my father um, passed away about five years ago. Uh, he was not a cigarette smoker. He was not a cigar smoker. He was not a pipe smoker. But he died of cancer, and the cancer began in his lungs. My father had gone to his doctor with his cough. The doctor said, well, Mr. Long, how long have you been smoking? My dad said, I never smoked. And he said, well, you have lung cancer. And he was shocked. My father was a scarfer in Youngstown Sheet and Tube. We're going to talk a little bit about institutional racism. It was the only job kind of that men like him could have gotten coming out of the Great Migration. He had, because of systemic racism, he's a brilliant man, he had a third grade education. So to get a job working in steel mills, labor uh, that paid you the way that teachers and firemen and policemen were paid was a good job. So Quint Charles Long worked in Youngstown Sheet and Tube for 30 years without missing a day's work. 30 years without missing a day's work. And that cancer was his reward. So I, I, I'm grateful to you, Charles, for this conversation, which focuses on the body uh, in, in some way, uh, talking about the wound, because it's, it's quite poetic and meaningful. It ties to the notion of the Pan-African notion of Ma'afa. Um, many Africans have said, well, well, we don't want to call our experience necessarily a Holocaust. I mean, that, that term has been used and uh, it is in some ways sacrosanct with regard to the Jewish experience. We don't have to have that word. So we can have our own word to describe our horror. The same way as Jews talk also about the Shoah. And so they said, well, well, we'll call this thing something out of Swahili, the Ma'afa, which can be seen as a grievous wound or a great disaster. And I, I'd like to focus on the grievous wound part. The other part that connects to my father, not just the wound of his cancer, but the fact that one of the things my dad and I like to do a lot, and I'm thinking perhaps it's genetic because I liked it as much as he did, was to sit and watch 48 hours, which can seem a little macabre, but you know, it's 48 hours is this kind of show of murders that have occurred. And the, the challenge is to solve the problem within 48 hours. And stats have shown that if police departments, investigators do not get a meaningful lead within 48 hours, the case is likely to become cold and the perpetrator of the murder is likely to go scot-free. So my father and I used to sit and, and watch the amazing forensic work, the, the amazing footwork that was put into place to find out the perpetrators of a disaster upon a particular body. And so I'm thinking about today that, well, you know, we're, this idea that 48 hours is, is that window that's needed for to begin to get to the bottom, bottom of things. I'm beginning to think also that, you know, if we look at the US experience and what has happened to the black body, 
um, we're coming up on like 408 years. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, almost we're at the 408 year mark as opposed to 48 hours of um, trying to get to the bottom of what happened to this body and what is happening to this body. And I think that that has implications for us all. It's, it's, it's very much in, in alignment with what uh, we often say in this gap. Uh, you know, that anti-Semitism begins with the Jews but does not end with the Jews. And I, I, would, I would say also that the racism and, and the violence on the body in the American experience begins with many people here, but it doesn't end with any of us. The, the violence against the Native American, the violence against the African, the violence against the Jews, the violence against the Irish, the violence against the women. And let us talk about the women because by the way, um, President, um, um, uh, of the President Fish, uh, Kevin Rome, did send his apologies. Uh, his chief of staff just texted me to say that he was pulled away for an emergency. But one of the things that he did last week was to begin with a conversation about the men. And I, I want us to kind of explode this other problem that we're having, which is the problem of noir and the eclipsing of the women. There's a wonderful piece, uh, powerfully sad, that's going around about these bodies, Pamela Turner, Sandra Bland, Brianna Taylor, Corin Gaines, Tatiana Jefferson, and Chantel Davis. And of course, the hashtag is say her name, right? And they're talking about these women too were victims of police brutality. So I'm asking that in our conversations that we not allow ourselves to be beaten up by a metaphor and not allow patriarchy and misogyny noir to eclipse these other human bodies. And Angela Davis tells us a great deal about that. There are a couple of people I want to mention. As I said, I want to talk about the world and then, then just end very quickly on my mom. Carlton, um, you have a, if you can finish in a moment, please. Okay, I will. Angela Davis, uh, race, women, and class. Uh, one of the things she talks about is this woman who was not picking cotton enough, but she had recently given birth. She was still nursing. The overseer began to beat her with a whip and blood and milk were flowing from her body at the same time, right? Because she wasn't moving quickly enough. She had just given birth, right? So this, this conversation about the body is deeply important for us. And so let us not eclipse the body of the woman, the black woman, uh, for the sake of massage noir and patriarchy, uh, but also let us remember things that people like Winthrop Jordan told us in White Over Black about the long history of the abuse of the body and then, um, and, and just uh, a baby to, to wave at what you said in Britain, I, I refer people uh, and Sunni um, to a, a powerful piece of poetry by Linton Quasey Johnson, Sunny's Letter, right? Where she talks about police brutality in Brixton, right? Uh, 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 decades ago. Finally, I said, I wanted to bring it back to my mom. There's a video out uh, if anybody wants to see what my mom looks like, you will see her doppelganger. There's a video out of a young man who has run a traffic sign and he's being held at gunpoint on the lawn of his grandmother's house. And the cops are screaming at him and he's swearing back at them and he's, he's saying, I'm afraid, I'm scared, I'm scared. And he's swearing at them, why are you doing this to me? Why are you pointing your gun at me? And they're like, stay down. And, he, and he's, his, his, his adrenaline is driving him to stand up, but also he's afraid of getting shot. And he's screaming out pitifully to protect his body. And the cops are saying, you ran a stop sign as they point their Rugers at him. When he explains, why, why, are, you, why are you aiming your guns at me? the poor man's, young man's mother, grandmother comes out in her house coat. And I promise you, she looks like Geneva Long. And she comes out and she saves his life. I would promise you. She says, leave my boy alone, leave him alone. And she's walking with a cane. And she says, leave him alone, leave him alone. They come in, they eventually knock her down in the process. And the boy is arrested for running a traffic sign, but he was almost blown away, except for his mother, his grandmother, who looked like my mother. And that's all of our mothers. And so that's where I ended. That's where I ended. And I would just say that, you know, we're talking about where we're going from here. I think the other conversation we really need 
is where have we been? Because that is weighing on and that murder has not been solved. Thank you very much, Carlton, for your powerful contribution and your wisdom. I'm really, I'm, uh, yeah, thank you all very much for your presentations. I'm going to give a brief presentation myself and then I'll open it up uh, for questions and discussion. So, you know, the work that ISGAP has been focusing on and that I've been focusing on is looking at globalization and anti Semitism, the increase of marginalization, socioeconomic marginalization globally. Um, and how this is impacting on identity and the rise of reactionary social movements. In terms of anti-Semitism, the reactionary social movements, in a sense, are threefold. We see the rise of the extreme right, the so white supremacy and nationalism. We also see the rise of political Islam and the rise of, I guess, postmodern, I would say, anti anti-Semitism and the attack on who Jews are as a people, not so much religious or racial, but who we are as a people. And we look at the Red-Green Alliance, for example, which is, I think, permeated universities um, and has made Jewish students and, um, and uh, faculty uncomfortable in the United States and in many liberal spaces in the West, in Europe and the West. And I'm reminded of the work and how this connects to, to racism and to the history of Nazism and fascism, which uh, um, you know, devastated the Jewish people, the sort of racist anti-Semitism. I'm reminded of some of the, the great work of David Patterson and Robert Wistrich that shows how white supremacy, and, and, and I'm choosing my words carefully, but Nazism forms the basis of political Islam, not Islam, but political Islam and the, the emergence of the Muslim Brotherhood and how the Muslim Brotherhood fuses Nazi ideology, racist ideology, European anti-Semitism with uh, Islam and how this is exported uh, around the world. And the, the rise of this type of anti-Semitism, which justifies attacks not just on Israel, not just on Israel and Zionism, but on Jewish communities in the diaspora. And I think if we can show, uh, Ira, if you can put up the cartoon by Latouf, this is a cartoonist that won the Holocaust Denial Award that the Iranian Revolution uh, regime ha held uh, a few years ago. So Iran, uh, this Latouf, is a Brazilian um, cartoonist. And this trope here we see uh, African Americans being targeted by the police, which is a very powerful symbol, kind of reaching out to the oppressed Palestinian. Um, and I think this trope, we, we did work at ISGAP, uh, this whole notion from, uh, from Ferguson to Gaza, the, this trope is directly connected to the nation of Islam. And the nation of Islam has played a role, a small role, Ira, you can take down the image if you want so I can see everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ira. So this trope, which has been spread by the Nation of Islam and it's targeting journalists, it's targeting artists, musicians in the African-American community, which are very important parts of the, of the community, of the ideology in the community, has been propagating this uh, horrible lie that American, it's 17 hours. American police officers are trained in Israel and the Israelis train American police officers to come back and shoot African-American men. And this trope has been circulating. And it's also, in, in my view, causing a, a deep rift between the African-American community and the Jewish-American community. And it's a painful rift. And I think, from my humble opinion, a way forward is that if we devise um, a deeper understanding of each other's communities, a deeper understanding of how to combat anti-Semitism and how to combat racism in the United States, and as Abebe said, internationally, and to create a progressive agenda. I would even say a protest movement, a social movement with an agenda that will address these deadly inequalities and these deadly, deadly forms of hatred that has been going on uh, in the case of racism for at least 400 years 
in the case, case of anti-Semitism, as Wistroff would call it, the longest hatred. So how do we overcome these divisions that are emerging within communities, within the Jewish community, within the African-American community, and divisions which are keeping, I'd say, progressive people and, and elements of the community that are committed to change, to, are committed to eradicating racism and anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred. How do we understand these complexities and these processes and really start to emerge with a clear view of reaching something better? And I'm reminded, and I think Baby reminded me of, of, of my engagement with the anti-apartheid movement. And in the anti-apartheid movement, we know that there were reactionary forces trying to divide communities, trying to divide uh, progressive movements from bringing real change to South Africa. And I think it's happening here. And I think there has to be a deeper understanding of what these uh, factors are and how to overcome them. And to, to educate people in the Jewish community and in other communities about the, 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 the depth and the power of racism. And also to reach out to the African American community to understand the, the concerns within the Jewish community of anti Semitism creeping into this debate in the African American community and in the wider society as well. And I'll just end with one, with one comment. And I think, and then Carlton and I spoke about it a little bit a few days ago when we were on the phone. I think in the struggle against anti-Semitism, which I've been very engaged in, and it, it affects us in the university, if, if scholars dealing with contemporary anti-Semitism, and I dare say Jewish scholars dealing with contemporary anti-Semitism, are engaged in a struggle. Um, if you want to graduate, if you want to get to a good university, if you want to finish your degree, if you want to get a job, if you want to get promoted, and you come out against contemporary anti-Semitism, you suffer. You, you literally suffer. And all of my colleagues engaged in the contemporary, the struggle against contemporary anti-Semitism have their scars. And as Sunni said, the inequalities in the educational system, the racist inequalities in the education system is also very clear. And I think one of the things that is, is, is really important is that when we feel alone, when we feel alone as a community, an ethnic or racial community, or a community of faculty and scholars fighting for some form of justice, and we're alienated and feeling attacked and alone, it's, it's a horrible position to be in. It, you, it's, you're, you're done. Emotionally, psychologically, and politically, you're in serious trouble. And I think the struggle against racism and anti-Semitism we need to build deeper understandings of what we're experiencing and how to forge an alliance of action. And um, Katya was talking about the importance of action. And um, I think that's, that's the key. So I think to, to, to empower people fighting for social justice and for people not to feel alienated alone in this common struggle uh, for a better social democratic future and to eliminate all forms of hatred from society, from the institutions in which we function in. Clearly racism right now, you can see the depth of it and the, the, the horrible, you know, when the, when the Jewish community was, a, was attacked in Pittsburgh in the synagogue, when the killing happened in New Jersey not too long ago, for a community to feel under siege, for the Jewish community that felt under siege at these moments, is is horrific and i think i i don't want to speak for other communities but i just see the african-american community under it's besieged and even in people perhaps hijacking the agenda of the african-american community with the protest is a whole other issue so how do we stand together and support each other and also devise a way forward and that's sort of the the context of the conversation that I would like to pursue with you. So if, does anybody on the panel like to say something? Harold stuck to the, the time limitations the most. I feel like I would like to ask Harold for <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, listen, I want to, first of all, thank each of you for sharing your, 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 your positions and your ideas about this whole development, this quagmire. 
uh, and um, I will say this, I want to try and you know, keep it within the, the time span. I, I'm convinced, I'm convinced that the way forward has to do, or it, it, we must embrace some things like understanding each other's culture. Definitely, we've got to get a handle on these institutions that shape minds and hearts. Um, we've got to find a way to make sure that these institutions advance you know, um, understanding and appreciating the other. Um, I think it'd be good if we can find ways to work together on common projects, since we have common problems. Um, all of these are important, because let me say this, I know this will probably start a, a little ruckus here, but we, 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 I, love, I love this gap. We like, we, like, we like to talk about things. I'm very disturbed a lot. Now, I'm not wanting to write off voting, uh, public policies and all that. I want to write those off. They have a place, I think they serve a purpose. But what I just don't get is how we think voting is going to stop racism. I just don't get that. I just don't. And, and, and I hear folks telling, well, the problem is you need to register to vote. You need to, why? Why? That, that, that's, what, that's how our millennials are going to respond. Why? When I see Brian Kemp and others doing things to hijack elections, tell me why. How, will voting, how would voting have stopped George Floyd's death? How would voting have stopped Ahmaud Arbery, Ar Arbery's, you know, assassination. How would it have stopped what happened to Breonna Taylor? Tell me how voting would have stopped any of that. I could argue that voting will enhance racism. So I'm, 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 I'm back to where I started. We've got to get at changing the hearts and the minds of people. Because I think outside of that, you simply, you simply can't legislate morality. You just can't do it. So the way forward, Charles and my colleagues, I'd like for us to consider you know, thinking about how, how important it is. We do what we need to do to make sure people, we can, we can disrupt and we can, we, can dis, we can somehow or another change stereotypes, how people think about folk, how people see people, how people perceive folk. Th that has got to be done. That's where Ben it is. I, my time's up. I have a lot, I have a lot to say. I'm not out of words, I'm out of time. So Harold, thank you. It's an interesting comment. As you were speaking, I was thinking of the South African context. So there was a political victory. Apartheid was defeated politically. Mandela became president. But structurally, economically, socially, culturally, the, segreg the apartheid segregation still right permeates the society. So, how do, so you raise a good issue. If, if voting doesn't change society, what does, what's the way forward? Maybe, maybe if I just say one word. Sure. Char? Go ahead, yeah. Okay, let me... Uh, we don't really have any system uh, except a democratic system to fight all these things. For voting is a small section of it, but that's another debate. What I would like to say is, in the, uh, uh, most of you remember the attack in Oklahoma by a white nationalist. And at that time, we were having a meeting at Black Studies uh, uh, meeting chaired by Cedric. And the secretary came to us while we were there that we've been threatened. Somebody said they'll burn us. And she was so red. And Cedric looked at her and said, she understood that better than us, he said. And we didn't know what he was talking about. What you're saying then was she's Jewish. She understood what it means to be burned alive. Okay? So I think what we miss is that we, I mean, what Charles, you're trying to say, we have to learn how to work together as minorities in Western societies. And we need to create a global system. It does, you know, we need to move on. Voting is important. Uh, I know what Harald is, is saying, uh, but it's a stepping stone to, and we don't have any other method of fighting this because what we have done in South Africa in other parts of the world, that after independence, we still have all those problems. Therefore, what I'm suggesting is we need to begin to work to a global dialogue where these issues are raised. I'll stop now. I'd like to jump in also, uh, just to piggyback okay. on. Carlton, go ahead, and afterwards will be Victoria then soon. Okay, great. All right, I'll make this very quick. Um, I, 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 I I'm, I'm baffled, really, by the response that some millennials are having and that Nick Cannon and a few others have embraced. I know that you, you, you referenced it, Harold, about this idea of not voting. For me, that's throwing the baby out with the batter. I, 
ba baby out with the bathwater. I'm absolutely baffled at the idea of not using, and, and even to look at Kemp as an example, is because a lot of people chose to sit out and they don't have Stacey Abrams as their governor. Because even though she won by votes through suppression and other chicanery, uh, Kemp has managed to get himself into the office. And then you have the, now you have the COVID-19 pandemic sitting on your doorstep without much remedy. And it's hard to believe, it is hard to believe that, that uh, State, uh, Governor Stacey Abrams would not have provided those communities the relief that they need. So my answer to them is COVID-19 is knocking on your doorstep because you didn't vote. Can I intervene here? So next, sorry, Victoria, then Suni, then Katya. How do, how do we get in? So oh, I, I, um, I do sympathize with the idea that voting isn't the panacea and it doesn't solve all the problems. And, but I, I do think that it makes a very important difference. And, um, you know, I was going to say, you know, of course it's true that the social contract was scarred and marred from the beginning in this country with the with the stain of, of slavery and racism. But, you know, I, skipping all the stuff that I'm sure we all agree about, I, I just want to fast forward to something that I thought was very helpful that happened under the Obama administration. I want to remember that we used to have President Obama, okay? That, that was different. And it's different. It's a difference worth reminding ourselves about there's a big difference between having President Obama and having a tin pot di dictator who coddles the far right and anti-Semites and racists. That's worth voting about. And I just want to say, you know, even though I was depressed by what Obama said, I was impressed by what he did because his task force on recommendations about police violence had some profound and important insights that can still be implemented. Are they gonna fix everything? Are they gonna change hearts and minds? No, but sometimes if you get the right spirit of cooperation, you can mitigate what you can't fundamentally change. And, and the focus of that, um, of the 40 pages of recommendations was to change the color, the culture of policing. The idea, the basic idea was that too many police officers are trained as soldiers and that we teach them to shoot and fight and restrain people. We don't teach them how to help. We don't teach them how to help in a mental health crisis. We don't teach them how to deescalate. We don't teach them how to manage complex situations. So police officers think of themselves as warriors and not guardians. And now I'm referring to remarks by Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative. And I thought he was a member of that task force and I thought his insights were profound. And he said, you know, police think of themselves as a distinct fraternal order, but not as members of a community. And he noted that what the task force found is that where cities have made progress on this issue are, where, are the cities where the citizens and community leaders have a direct role in hiring officers and uh, people in charge and developing policies. And this then created a partnership be between communities and the police. And where there was that kind of partnership, it was good for the police, it was good for the community, and it promoted public safety. Our hands aren't tied. There are things we can do. Voting matters because when we have voting, we, have, we can have Obama, we can have a Justice Department that works better if it doesn't entirely work and we can have policies that at least are trying to take these things on in a constructive, well-informed, data-driven way. Okay, that's all I want to say about that. Thanks, thanks, Victoria. So SUNY and then Katya, and then Katya. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a hip hop, uh, from the hip hop generation and uh, Ice-T had an album uh, years ago, Kill at Will, and, and in the lyrics he said, economics is the gun and politics is its trigger, right? And so part of that, uh, I understand what Dr. Ben is saying, but I think part of that process of politics is being able to legislate and protect and insulate your communities from the, the violence and the supremacy and the challenges that you encounter from folk who do not mean you well. And so this debate goes back to when W.E.B. Du Bois was challenging uh, Booker T. Washington, right? One, one person said, hey, economic empowerment is the key. And the other person, uh, 
you know, Dr. Du Bois and Dr. Trotter was saying, wait a minute, you can, you could build these black towns, but people can come in and destroy them. And there's no laws that will protect them or, or arrest them for, for doing so. And, and when we look at Ida B. Wells, when she created the anti-lynching law, it was, it was designed to speak against just that. And here we are today, I think the anti-lynching law is being, uh, is on the floor of Congress now. And, and what happened, what happened unfortunately in Minnesota was a lynching. And so uh, when we talk to our young people, right now I'm mentoring a couple of young people who are in the streets of Chicago at night. One thing they tell me, look, uh, uh, on one hand, you know, they're part of the nonviolent piece, but then there are people who are with them, who mean them well, and they're saying the nonviolence, they're not hearing that. They're not feeling that. What they hear and listen to is the violence. And so that'll bring them to the table. And, and just to end with this, Dr. King and Malcolm X had that same symbiotic connection. We like to separate them as the double consciousness theory, but reality is, you know, Dr. King would go into the meetings to sit across from the people to negotiate, right, to create legislation that benefits us today, you know, Fair Housing Act, there are African Americans that live in white suburban communities, right? There, there are benefits that legally have happened because of what was fought for. And Dr. King would say, hey, if you don't listen to me, there's somebody outside the door and he's not like me, right? And so that would give him more ammunition in these, in these meetings. So we have to be able to bring young people to the table, give them direct action strategy to empower them. Otherwise, they're going to go to the other uh, vehicle, which they think it's bringing folk to the table and causing them to listen. So, Sunny, before we go to Katya, just a quick question. From your understanding of what's happening on the, on the street, do you think that there is an agenda, there's a clear agenda, like in the anti-apartheid movement or in the civil rights movement, where there were people, pro, like, there were more liberal people, there were more radical people, but they had very clear stated agendas. Do you think that in 2020, there is an agenda? There is, there is a goal? It, it varies, you know, it depends on, so there are people who have agendas and have strategies in terms of protesting and asking for, hey, defund the police, right? We're here to talk about defunding police in terms of how they're utilizing our communities. Um, there's that aspect, there's a, the aspect of creating a federal law that says, hey, we need to enforce that, we need to get coalitions together to push that through our legislation, through our representatives. Uh, but in terms of when you're out there, people are emotional. And it's, it's, it's reaction to the being tired, being sick of being tired. And when you, when you see the, the, I call it the explosion happening, it's because people are inventing. They don't have the direction that fosters in them that this is going to change, right? That you don't have to go this route. And without that, you know, people are going to react how they think will best serve their interests. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sunni. Katja has been waiting patiently. Go ahead. Yeah, isn't that, that's not my middle name. Just one <laughs> correction. My last name is pronounced Mivarach. Sorry, sorry. At the end, not just for you, John. Okay, I just want to say a couple of things. One is, we're spinning words here. So we should acknowledge that we're all just spinning words and that there's lots of talking heads today. There are always are talking heads when there is a moment of crisis. That is a reality. And the other thing, I think all of us who happen to be at the panel panelists today are way above the age of our 20s. And so depending on how old you are, you have seen more or less protest movements, escalations, violence against material property, which can be rebuilt. And I do understand that material property can sometimes be a person's lifeline, okay? So if your property is destroyed and you are living in a neighborhood where it was hard enough to get a mortgage in the first place, it's gonna be very difficult to rebuild. And maybe that's where all the Jay-Z's and Beyonce's and Tyler Perry's and the huge amount of wealth that's out there needs to have a fund to help people rebuild in communities where 
economic, where the economic basis is weak. I'm not even talking about Soho, New York, and so forth. But it is a distraction, which unfortunately Fox News likes to pay close attention to. It is a distraction to focus merely on those elements that have been destructive against property. And I want to include in that that we do not know, but I'm willing to put my money and bet that much of that destruction is just what Trevor Noah said about South Africa. Those are people who are paid or who are encouraged to be instigators and in order to distract attention from the overwhelming majority of young people, a multicolored rainbow of young people who are engaged in peaceful protest. We need the outrage. We need the emotion, we need the reactive power in order to get attention. Having said that, having said that, the other piece is what happens the day after. And there is always a day after. Protests do not last for years on end, not in Hong Kong, not in Tunisia, not in Algeria, not in Paris, not in Johannesburg, they don't. So there is something that has to happen afterwards. In the case of South Africa, and I think everybody in the panel knows that, the African National Congress for years had a very, very tight group of people working in different areas, whether it was law and the constitution, or whether it was history and so forth, very tight for the day after apartheid would end. Has it worked out perfectly? No, but there were people in place. I think in the United States, and that's where the US is different from other places. Voting, people died to vote. A lot of people died so that everybody would have the right to vote. I don't think that we should put it as either this or that. We have to vote. I hear people, in fact, I hung the phone up on somebody uh, a few days ago who said, well, I'm not gonna vote. I'd rather have the system fall apart. Well, people went out and voted for Trump I went and voted for Hillary Clinton, and I can't stand Hillary Clinton, and I couldn't stand her then, but I went and I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. I voted so that Trump wouldn't win. None of people did that. We have an election coming up. An electoral college still determines who votes. That didn't change under Obama. If those border states gain the vote over the popular vote, we will really be in a mess because this is just the beginning of the mess. I don't see Trump falling apart tomorrow. He's not being taken down. Nobody is saying, shame on you. Have you no shame the way they did to McCarthy? So I think we have to have multiple strategies, not just one. And the last, the last comment, because I can't, I mean, we all have so much to say. But the last comment on what to do if we, those of us who are academics, those of us who teach, we have a big responsibility to temper the rhetoric in the classroom. Because the rhetoric is great outside in the street, but in the classroom, it's really, really important to give students an understanding that history, the events which took place, took place in particular moments. And one of the tropes, and I think it's unfortunate, is that we forget the huge differences of opinion between Marcus Garvey, Booker T. Washington, and W.E.B. Du Bois. They did not see eye to eye. They would have been appalled to be put into the same camp. It's only in retrospect that we can extrapolate the things that overlapped. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and I was 16, 17, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I mean, I was though, I, I listened to Malcolm X. I couldn't understand those uh, grown ups at the time who were willing to go with being peaceful. It's only in retrospect that we see the one single picture of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X together smiling and we make the bridge. But it wasn't that Malcolm, that Martin Luther King actually said, it's what we thought. But it wasn't that he actually said, well, you either deal with me or you'll deal with Malcolm X. That was a, that was a trope. And young people do have to understand that. And sometimes the reality of things which occurred, the facticity of things which occurred, are inconvenient because they interrupt and they, they disrupt, that we have to acknowledge. It's like Denzel Washington, who I love, being cast as Malcolm X, which took meant that we didn't have to talk about color hierarchy within the Black community. 
And the last point that I want to make is having been on Israeli radio earlier in the week and asked the question about Antifa, let's remember something. Antifa stands for anti-fascist. And actually, in the forward of today, there is an article which reproduces the actual document in Yiddish of Antifa, that was the name of the group, who were both pro-Zionist and who were Arab. It was a coalition. So I recommend looking that up. But what is for sure is that if we, and some of the comments that were in the chat box, if there is a focus only on the marginal violent group, we will lose sight of those strong forces that are peaceful, that simply are saying enough is enough. I don't want to walk out of my door and have a target on my back, whether I'm 68 and a black brown skinned woman, or whether it's somebody who is 17 or 18, or in the case of George Floyd, 46. We can't go back to that. We need accountability. We don't need more. Let's sit around kumbaya and try to understand, which is what the multi-million dollar diversity industry has done for over 25 years. Thank you, Katja. So uh, Ansel, uh, if you want to comment, you're the only one who hasn't commented. I see you're having trouble with your camera. You can hear me? You're, you're on mute, uh, Ansel. Yeah, okay, yeah I, think, um, uh, I think Dr. Bennett raises an important point, but I think uh, what we have to recognize is that while voting alone will not make a difference, we need a real policy agenda. You know, I think Katja raised an important point that uh, we can't change the way people feel about us. And I think she even says she doesn't care how people feel about us. But the weaponization of people's racism is what we have to protect ourselves. That's the siege that we have to, that Charles mentioned, that we have to protect ourselves against. And the only way that we can protect ourselves against the siege is a real concrete policy agenda. One of the things that I'm seeing with the protest, it's important. It's important to shine the light on the issue, but the protest alone without a concrete agenda behind it will not yield the results that we need and must see. For example, in the civil rights movement, the leaders were ingenious and brilliant in, in crafting and coordinating and organizing with an agenda that they brought to the table. When the leaders came to Dr. King and the other leaders of the civil rights movement, they weren't, you know, asking for, you know, what was, what is the agenda that you have for our community? They had an agenda. They brought an agenda to the table, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. Civil rights Act. And so that's what I see with, with, with this generation is that they're saying, what is the agenda? But I would say we need to go further. Instead of asking for the agenda, we need to set the agenda and demand that those we elect into office not only get our votes, but they carry out the agenda that we generate. And this is what I think is um, sort of that distinction between what we've seen in the past, the effectiveness of the past and what we need to see in the present is we need a concrete policy agenda at the federal level, I might add, because as I mentioned in my opening comments, I do not believe the states will in good faith police themselves. We need federal policy. We need stakeholders and um, thought experts to come together and put together an agenda that will change this reality that we're seeing unleashed against black people and people of color in this country. Thank you, Ansel. So I'm gonna, there's, a, there's many questions. I'm gonna pose a couple, collect a couple of questions and then the panel can comment. Uh, Robin Bell made a comment saying that he always taught that you have no right to complain or, or protest, that you, you should try to make a difference if you are not even willing, you, that you should try to get out to vote basically, to vote first, and voting shows a, a first intent to support protest, make the world a better place. Voting won't solve the problem, but it shows a mindset committed to change. That's a comment by uh, Robin Bell. Um, Greg Mashberg asks an interesting question. Um, he said, I would like to see a probing discussion uh, with experienced police officers to address why, what might have been going through the mind of uh, Chauvin as he murdered Floyd. Chauvin is not going to tell us, but, but I think in order, in order to, it's, ur uh, it's urgent to understand as best we can 
what his mindset was. I think it's essential to understand the mentality of this brutality in order to interdict it. Um, yeah, so these are two comments. Does anybody want to? Yeah, I just want to jump in just quickly on, on the Chauvin piece. I mean, what I've seen some, some people saying we can't get into his brain, but one, what, what some people have said is, look, it looks to us like to me that there's a meta conversation going on with his violence. That is that he was trolling the woman who had the camera on him. Like, I'm going to show you. Yeah, keep your camera on. Guess what? I'm going to stay here. Keep filming me. Guess what? I don't care. I'm looking you straight in your face. So what? What are you going to do about it? I'm the cop. So we think that some of us believe that that was just a meta conversation of trolling. Uh, but the, the other thing I would just say in terms of the, 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 the voting piece, there are specific recommendations out there. I mean, color of change, a number of groups. And, and Georgetown professor Paul Butler had a brilliant uh, recommendation uh, this week when he was speaking with Brian Williams on M MSNBC. He said, I'll give you one policy recommendation, violent arrests for violent offenses. He said, but if, if, if there's a nonviolent uh, uh, offense, write a ticket, issue a summons. It, running a, a traffic light shouldn't have you with a Ruger pointed at your head, or, or you should not be chokehold because you have um, given a $20 bill that someone finds suspect. So just a basic policy recommendation such as that, uh, not using violence uh, even as a, as a remedy, unless that is in your arsenal with relationship to a violent offense is a start. So Carlton, I just got a comment from Dr. Reverend James Vegan, And he said, after listening to you, that Carlton's official job title should be the head of pedagogy, rhetoric, and theology for his gut. <laughs> I, I agree, we just started with rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> Harold, you look like you're... Oh, I have a lot. I, I, I'm enjoying this conversation and I'm uh, on the one hand, I'm I'm somewhat I'm kind of I'm kind of conflicted, and I will tell you why I'm conflicted. Um, I was reared in a home where my mother was an advocate for social action and for voting. I mean, that was something I grew up with my mother at the polls, just just out there in the mornings with her, seeing the importance of voting, and and I get that. But I also am convinced that um, in order to effect change in our communities, once again. I'm just not so sure how much the voting and the policy stuff is going to do. I've not heard anybody tell me how voting will stop what we've seen. I mean, I think, and, and when I say what we've seen, what we're experiencing, it's kind of like um, Fanon, Fanon, that piece, Black Skin, White Mask. He has a piece in there where he talks about the, uh, the, the lived experience of a black man. And Fanon talks about more than anything else, the fact that a person's a phenotype, a person's color, color in this case, brings with it a whole legacy of ideas, a whole set of traditions. And, and it's like, Fanon is saying because of the skin issue, you know, there's just no way out of being, being in this kind of, um, this kind of walled in kind of environment. So what I am saying is, again, we have got to do something about ideas. We've got to do something about perceptions. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that that's the way, that that's the way forward. And if, and if we, I just don't want us to think that um, this whole that that, that 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 voting is really our answer. I just don't think that's 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 going that's that's really the answer. I'm just telling y'all. Yeah, I don't think voting. It's not about vo only voting. Voting is one piece in a democracy where people vote. That is where you can express your views at the ballot box. So voting should be something that is a default, a must do. You vote. The, it's not the only action. It's not the band-aid. It's not the cure-all. But people went out to, you know, the Tea Party organized itself very well. They were marginal. They didn't exist. But they do now. They managed to get the person they wanted elected successfully. There's somebody in the presidency of the United States right now. That's a reality. That is a reality. Who can be elected a second time or not? Voting, we can have laws against murder. It doesn't stop murder. We have laws against child abuse. Child abuse is rampant at the moment. So it's not either or. And yeah, um, I, I did say, I don't care what somebody thinks about me. Just don't get in my way and block my opportunity. Because then I'll go, I'll, I'll, move, I'll move on forward and knock you down. Or you'll knock me down. One of us is going to be down. 
and somebody will take its place. We don't necessarily need big leaders. That was the great strength of the anti-apartheid movement is that in the West, there were heroes, but inside of South Africa, people understood you can kill a hero, but there'll be two more in their place. So I'm only saying that for our purposes, for the public, for, for now, as we move forward, we need to have policies that have teeth to them. And that somebody knows if you, if you commit a crime, exactly. if racism is a crime, then you will be punished. And that has not yet taken place in America, or it's taken place in very short moments for a second. Doc, can I, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to add to, I had a professor at Howard University, Dr. Uh, Ronald Walters, who used to be part of the Reagan administration. He would come and teach us in our political science class. And he always said, politics is, politics starts at the local level. So when we think about um, mothers against drunk drivers, that was a grassroots local issue that became legalized to penalize people who were driving drunk and killing people, right? When we look at spousal abuse in, in, this, it's in this country and throughout the world, men weren't arrested or, 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 or you know, identified as problematic if they would beat their wives. But now you have laws that are against that. And so, and that started at a local level. And I think what we're saying here too, we need community police boards where like in Chicago, we have the CAP program. It's no teeth in it, but it, 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 it's really good at working together with police at the local level to be able to talk, communicate, but also identify problems with policing. And one of the problems in this case, Minnesota, this guy was a rep, well, he had 12 complaints. Why isn't he at least off the force, right, suspended with community policing boards in motion with teeth, with policy behind it, you can actually identify the cops who have these problems, right? Another issue that I'm hearing in the protest, people are saying as an agenda, start rotating some of these cops because there's mental fatigue it, with them working in certain communities because they actually are, uh, they have mental health issues based on the problems that they have to deal with every day in certain communities. And like the military, you almost have to rotate them out of these neighborhoods, bring in cops, fresher mindset, new perspective with proper training, working with local police, um, community police boards. So I think there are some real strategies here but politics start at the local level. And if we don't start locally, then nothing's gonna change. I live personally in a suburban community. I'm going to a protest this week, right? And I'm living in an exclusive white community. There's a lot of racism here. Racism is just not in Chicago, Detroit. It's in these communities where I live, right? And so we have to start locally where we live. We have to demand reform and we have to do it in a way that creates new policy. And if I could just add yeah. one thing from my, my field from political science, there is this notion of real politics. So again, <clears throat> the idea of, of not voting is still baffling to me because it is at least an, an attempt to get a foothold to power. So if we sit back and say, no, 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 I'm gonna let other people vote. I'm gonna sit this one out. Guess what's gonna happen? Somebody else is gonna have his foot or her foot on your neck politically. So to abrogate that access to power is baffling to me. All right, can y'all hear me? <laughs> Will somebody tell me how voting would have changed what we're dealing with now? Because if you wanna talk about accountability, you still are going to have, you're hoping that the people to whom you have to answer don't share the values of the people who per perpetrated the crimes. I mean, you're you're so premising it though on the on idea that voting must be a panacea. We, we've conceded that voting is not a panacea. Okay. Therefore, you, you're using, you know, we're not going to use the bullet of voting to kill the problem of racism because that's not what it's designed to do. But the bullet of voting is, is designed to get your behind in a seat where but you can exercise then, some power, which then can mitigate, can mitigate the impact of the problem of racism. 
That's all. Pastor, perhaps let me give let me give an example of this of simple of what voting does. With my daughter, I was driving in Pretoria. A group of white nationalists were beating up young uh, people who are selling um, rugby stuff. White guys beating the thing. This is post-apartheid, and we didn't know what to do. Within five minutes, the law enforcement people showed up and arrested this white nationalist. This is post-94 South Africa. For You need to change. You need to a processes of change to allow you to begin to change the whole thing. It's not that it would stop something, but you put structures which allow you to do that. Or else, who do we live in? I mean, we don't have any other system except at least up to now, I mean, we, you know, as uh, Katia was saying, most of us have seen this thing is, but I have yet to see any other way except enforcing law and order, which reflects the interest of everyone, not... So, if, if I may, I, th to, uh, I think, Harold, in a way, you answered your own question, in my humble opinion, because you were saying it has to be about ideas, and the... The tagline at ISGAP is that we're fighting anti-Semitism on the battlefield of ideas. And it, Abraham Lincoln said something very eloquent. I'm going to you know, massacre his quote, but he said something to the effect that what students study today becomes policy in the next generation. So I think it's incumbent upon us as scholars to teach students good ideas about these issues. And hopefully, the next generation will start to implement them and it will affect policy. And if we affect policy, it will start to change people's behavior. I hope education is a key. And can you know, I, one, Charles, yeah, one, can I add something with that, with this point? Um, you know, there's, a, there's a legal concept um, in a crime. There are two concepts. One is mens re, the evil mind, and actus re, the evil act. And the law does not address the evil mind. It's when the evil mind meets the evil act that mm -hmm. the law steps in and says, no, there's recourse. And so what I, what I, would, what I would say to uh, this question is that the law does not address or remedy the mind, but it does stop the evil act. And it provides a deterrent to evil acts. It also serves as a recourse for those who have been the victim of evil acts. And to the point that um, Dr. Long raised concerning the policy ideas that, that are out there, there are, in fact, many policy ideas that are floating out there. But what I am suggesting and what I am positing is that we need a coordinated, organized effort to move policy that comes from the community, not from the top down, but from the grassroots, a coordinated, organized effort. And that's what we saw during the civil rights movement that I believe is missing in the problems that we're facing today. Yeah, I would just say again, to go back, everybody, all of us should go back and reread Malcolm X's Ballad or the Bullet. And it has to be read in the context of the 60s. We're in a different place today. But he was very clear about history. He was clear about the American Revolution. He was clear about the idea that if you don't gain power, you can't implement power. You can't make change if you're on the margins, if you're outside of those who are making decisions. And one of the worst things that we can say is if there's no anti-lynching bill, it's because there has never been enough advocates within the Congress to pass an anti-lynching bill. It just seems to me a complete abdication of responsibility. If we who teach do not insist, do not repeat like a hammer in the young people's minds in our classrooms. You can go and protest, you can go and advocate, but you have got to vote. You have got to make sure that everybody that you think that you're advocating for has been registered to vote. It's not enough to complain about gerrymandering. There's gerrymandering, okay? So should we stay at home or should we go out and in the meantime, fight one thing while carrying out something else. W.E. Du Bois did not support, he did not, he was unhappy about sending people to war. He understood that there were terrible things happening in World War II. He understood there were terrible things happening specifically to Jews in World War II. So he said, 
go and fight. Join the military and fight. And then come back and fight discrimination at home. We're not living in the 1940s. It can seem like that, but we're the, the reality is that we're not but we're still living in a bad place. I just think that the idea of not voting is just, to me, totally off the wall. More than anything right now, the sober thing to do is to get as many people registered to vote as possible. And at the same time to explain, yeah, keep on being active, be activist, be radical activist, but you've got to get the person in power out of power. And in this country, Barring a military coup, which none of us really would want to see, the best way to do that is to exercise the right to vote at the local level, because the local level is the most important, just what you just said, voting locally and voting at the national level. I'd also be interested in um, some researchers uh, digging into the presence of, of, of Russian bots and, and Russian uh, uh, provocateurs in suppressing uh, the vote amongst the black uh, population. Uh, there certainly has been enough evidence from 2016 in terms of their interference, not meddling, but interference in the version of our election. And uh, this conversation, peculiar though it is, may not have its origins grassroots in the United States. Up to I think, you know, con, con, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Abebe, and then Victoria. Follow up yeah. to, a quick follow-up to Katya's remark about the absence of an anti-lynching law. Um, many of you probably know this, but the anti-lynching law after 155 years was passed in the House of Representatives a few months ago, and it is being held up currently in the Senate by one vote. That vote is Senator Rand Paul. And why is Senator Rand Paul holding up the anti-lynching bill? Because he's worried that it might be construed too broadly. In other words, maybe like being lynched horizontally is too broad and you should only be lynched vertically. Like, um, so I just say that is such a overwhelming disgrace. Um, and it just shows you sometimes just one person with their hand on the lever can hold up some justice that is very long overdue. So thank you, Katya, for mentioning that. Uh, so in light of what you just said, Victoria, we have a comment from uh, Jeffrey Bernard, and he says, getting a person, getting the person in power or out of power does not mean that we will not find ourselves in the same p position that we are in today. Mm -hmm. It may not be the individual actor. Mm -hmm. um, okay. uh, we can have an anti-abuse anti law. We, we have laws that prohibit beating women. We have laws that prohibit abuse of children. We have laws about pornography. We don't have a panacea. The Messiah has not come. So we're not going to sit on our hands until the Messiah comes. Because, well, this didn't help over here. She got killed anyway. He got raped anyway. We have to work with what there is and then work for something better. Um, Just to, to reply to Car I, I, what Carlton has said about conspiracy theory, I think we need to be careful because that has become the major thing. For instance, what happened in uh, Minneapolis? There was a whole community talking about, this is uh, created by basically George Soros, that's what he's doing, etc., etc. What do the people in Minneapolis Jewish community do? They stop everything else, they go into a holiday, they begin to organize themselves again in this kind of conspiracy. For I think we need to be very careful how we handle that because it, it creates it creates a position where people say, oh, we are not in moral control. It's actually Putin who's putting this out. It's the Chinese who are doing this, etc. But it's actually the worst part of it is the old anti-Semitism, anti-black, anti-racist groups coming up with explanations which we need to fight and we need to be open we need to be democratic i mean that was what the strength of anti-apartheid movement was that it was yeah. you can you know Mandela was in prison for 27 years but it hasn't stopped the, the public for i think we need to create this this movement which allows us to to fight back yeah and just you know, as a as a footnote you know let's look uh, cross-culturally hitler was elected right so was Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and election matters. 
voting matters. Yeah. I, you know, I think, you know, I think it's a given that elections and voting matters. The question, I think, particularly the question that this generation, this, this emerging generation wants to know, then what? Right? The, the interview with Charlemagne, the guy was essentially, what have you done for me lately? Then what? What is the agenda? So, you know, as I, as I mentioned in my opening comments, police brutality, racism, all of these things that we're seeing did not start four years ago. They've been with us for 100 years. So once the election is had and the, le the levers of power change, then what? What is the agenda? And that's what I'm speed the agenda, the clear coordinate, I agree, is not, it's essential, but it's not the answer. You have to have policy and you have to be able and willing to hold leaders accountable and not simply put them in office to maintain the status quo. And that's where we have to go to the next level, in my opinion. Yes, and a lot of those young people who are saying, now what, they're part, the, the, the answer to some of them is, you're part of the now what? Get your behind out there and run for office. Get out there and draft policy. You are part of the now what? Don't look to me, you know, to feed you. You're part exactly. of it. Exactly. I mean, that is the most important thing. It's not, oh, well, what do I do? You know, everybody loves to read, or they used to love to read, half of Wretched of the Earth. That's Fanon's book. They love to read the part about the revolution and about the necessity for blood. What they didn't love to read is the second part of the book, which was after the revolution. After the revolution, there are no cameras. After the revolution comes the hard, tedious daily work of educating people, of getting rid of class economic injustice. I mean, we can go down to literature. We all know the, 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 the literature. But the answer to young people has got to be, don't just, what you just said, Carlton, don't look to me for the answer. What is your, what are you going to do today? And when you go to sleep tonight, you want to answer the question, what did you do for change today? If all you did was go and wave a banner and shout with some friends, well, you didn't do a goddamn thing, excuse my French. So I, if I you a, a, teach a child how to read, so they know how to go to vote, so they know how to help their mother or their grandmother go to the doctor, so the doctor has to take the grandmother or the mother or the father or the sibling seriously, then you did not do your job. The point is we need both to hold people accountable and we have to hold individuals to be res responsible for making change. Yes. So we, yes. we have about seven or eight minutes left. So I have a, a question for, for all of you. So we're, you're referring back to great leaders of churches, intellectual leaders, books. We live in a time of social media and the, the protests are being coordinated through Facebook or WhatsApp or they're tweeting or whatever the new TikTok app is, whatever it is. Are, are these people, is this, and I don't guess I like an old man, but is this generation reading the ideas? Are ideas guiding them? Or, you know, somebody like Martin Luther King and the leaders of the church, the moral authority of a Mandela or a Martin Luther King, are we living in an age where it's, it's the age of information and tweets in less than 46 characters? And how does that affect creating an agenda? Because I, I'm not clear and I, I could be out of the loop. When you look at the civil rights movement or the anti-apartheid movement or the Soviet Jewry movement, it was a clear um, agenda Absolutely. and mission. What's happening today? Is it, are we living in this information age where just information is fluid and I, I, I have a, uh, I, I have a, um, a phrase that I'll throw out there. It just came to me. Um, and I'm, a, I'm afraid that we might be moving this, but I think they're moving towards the post-cognitive uh, era, era generation. And we have to do something about that. <laughs> that's a good uh, well, motion. Yeah. Well, well, you would, know, Charles, uh, young people, young people are, Young people are engaging in ideas. Um, I have young people in my house. I have young people in the classroom. There are young people in the community with whom I engage. They are engaging ideas. But I think 
Uh, well, let me say, first of all, I do concur with what Carlton said about uh, we have to take responsibility true. And um, all generations have to accept responsibility, but I do believe that we cannot abdicate responsibility to provide guidance and a vehicle and be a con to channel young people's frustration so, so, so that when they're, they're, they're engaging these ideas that Charles has, has mentioned, that they know how they can do more than just vote. How can you engage in real policy change that's going to affect your lives and your communities? Uh, you know, you either need to vote or you need to figure out what you need to do next. We need to give guidance. And I think that's where the thought leaders have to take responsibility for the next generation. It's a good point. Thank you. Can I add that to that too? I, I really like what you said because young people are looking for leadership and guidance. They really are. And one thing that's coming out of this whole uh, protest <clears throat> uh, rebellion movement is the fact that uh, we're not hearing from the old guard of leadership as we once did, which I think is refreshing. And uh, I think it is important for us to, in our classrooms, this is where we have these strategic conversations and help support them because they are looking for ways to uh, affect what, what they're doing on the ground level. Now, my question kind of goes back to something that, that I've heard a lot share, a lot of my colleagues sharing about an agenda, about organizations and being organized, these, these kinds of things. My question would be, to whom should this community that's frustrated you know, to whom should they look for leadership? How do you how do you put together a common agenda without having leadership? You know, who should the leader be? How should the leader? How should one ascend to that to that position? How how, how do we resolve that issue? Because I think that's a very serious problem, a challenge now. Because unlike in like unlike previously, we had you know Malcolm, we had Martin, you know, we had Du Bois, we had we had we had Hugh and Newton. We had others who could actually marshal, get the people together. I think that's a noticeable lacuna now. It's not there. There's a break. There's a gap. It's not there. To whom should they look? How should this person be recognized? You know, and I think that's part of our challenge. And, I, and I, I'd like to hear, hear you all's thoughts about that, because I think that's very important to put together an agenda and have somebody to help us move this thing forward, to help us, you know, Chris, put it together, galvanize it, so to say. I think some of, the, some of it will come from that new generation, too. I mean, it's, it's kind of like we had, you know, we had the NAACP, we also had SNCC, right? So we're seeing amongst a Black Lives uh, Matter group, we saw with a young woman uh, who hosted uh, the uh, talk from the uh, uh, Obama Center the other day. There are a number of spokespersons who are emerging from the ranks. I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with their interpretations of the problem or the solution. But we do have them, but I do agree that there needs to be more of a dialogue. And I do think that there needs to be more, more of a focus on scholarship too, because a lot of students are shooting from the hip and they haven't read the grades. And there are a lot of answers that the grades have given us. And, and um, that, that, is, that is a vacuum that exists for sure. Uh, and, uh, uh, on, that, on that important note, Carlton, I think we're going to have to end because we've been going at this for two hours. Um, so some of us are, have to break. But I would be very happy and honored to continue the conversation soon. Uh, maybe we can have another Zoom, Zoom and R, whatever they're called. And also, as uh, Harold and some of you have said during the course of the two hours, to think of programs that we could potentially do together as scholars. Um, at this very important moment in uh, in global it's history, uh, you know, there's been protests sparking up all over Canada, all over the UK. Black Lives Matter. There's a big protest in Oxford, of all places. Uh, Black Lives Matter. So the world is watching, and uh, hopefully, we can we can do something as a as a group of uh, people who are concerned about these matters. Okay. Thank, thank you all very very much. It's great Thank to you. see everybody, and uh, um, yeah, it, we're honored by your insights and wisdom. So thank you, and be safe and be well and be strong. So we'll, we'll power to the people. Power to the people. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> thank you. All right.
Alright, this is 